We do come together in the name of Jesus Christ, and today we come together on Christ the King Sunday. It's not that Jesus isn't king any other day of the week, but today especially as we conclude the arc of the Christian year. Today is the last day of the Christian year, because next Sunday we begin Advent, where we begin to prepare for and wait for and watch for light to come in the darkness, something I think we can all understand right now. But we come together in the King's name, in Jesus' name. And when we come in His name, we come in the way that He teaches and the way that He acts. We come in His life, in the way that He has overcome death, but has gone through death for us. So in that life, we come together. For those of you who are at home, we welcome you as well. I am happy to see, Dennis, I'm going to pick on you. Dennis Rester's back behind the camera again. Dennis, I haven't seen you in forever, and I am so glad to see your face, especially you. The congregation is all waving at Dennis now. But church, we find whatever way we can to assemble in the name of Jesus. And for those of you who are at home, you are welcome here. You are part of our fellowship as we come together. A few announcements that I want to make as we continue are moving into worship. It's angel tree time. We have a tree outside. And for those of you who are here, if you want to grab one of those angels, for those of you who are at home, if you'll call Faith at the office, Faith can help pick an angel for you and make sure we make that these children actually receive a good Christmas. And this year we are partnering with the Salvation Army's angel tree. So we have that going on. The Lights of Love continues. Um, And I've heard from the UMW that that is going gangbusters right now. So for all of your generosity, let's continue to do it, continue to light, uh, put some lights up in love for people um, and benefit these organizations that the UMW is supporting. Um, Wanted to announce also that the children are gathering today at 3 o'clock here in the sanctuary to do some hanging of the green, not all of it. We're going to help us get a big chunk of it ready because we can't do our normal Advent hanging of the green like we would normally do it. But next Sunday, the first Sunday of Advent, we will be concluding the hanging of the green, but the children are going to help us prepare for worship today at 3. And also one last thing, that the church office um, will be closed on Thursday and Friday, but just know that uh, you can contact us if it's an, an issue or an emergency on our cell phones. But now, church, as we come together in the name of Christ, let's lay aside all other concerns. Let's return to the deepest truth that we can know, that our King, Jesus, welcomes us, that our King, Jesus, wants us to come here, and that our King, Jesus, comes also in the lives of the poor and the sick and the hungry and the hurting, and the widows, and the orphans. But now, let us turn our hearts and minds to worship. I invite you to rise as you are able and join together in our call to worship, followed by our opening hymn of praise, and then our responsive praise to Christ the King. God is here. Christ the King is here. The Holy Spirit is here is blowing among us. Let us join in in praise. Come worship Jesus Christ, Alpha and Omega, the one who is, who was, and is to come. We come to worship the one who rules justly. Come to worship Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. Bread of heaven, God with us, good shepherd, true vine, eternal word, the great I am, wonderful counselor, prince of peace. We come to worship Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords, To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen.
Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? There is one. He is the Lion of Judah who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy of this? He is. Worthy is the Lamb. He is King of glory. From every people and tribe, every nation and tongue, he has made us a kingdom of priests to God to reign with the Son. Does the Father truly love us? He does. Does the Spirit move among us? He does. And does Jesus, our Messiah, hold forever those he loves? He does. Is he worthy? He is. He is, he is, worthy is the Lamb, he is the King of glory. Yes, Sherry, come forward. It's time for our children. For those of you who are here and want to come down here and join me, one of the other children. Otherwise, for those of you who are at home, we have someone special among us. Someone who looks really better dressed than the rest of us. Interestingly dressed, for sure. <laughs> come on down, Benton. What do you think? Do you like my outfit? Yeah? He's kind of grinning. It's, it's an interesting outfit, isn't it? Is it what I wear usually, Benton? No, uh-uh. No, it's not. Well, today is Christ the King Sunday. And I couldn't help but just start thinking about Jesus as King. It's pretty cool to think about. So help me for a minute here, Benton and Trey. When we think about kings... What do we usually think about? What do you see when you picture a king? A big throne. Well, today it's a stool, but it pretend that it's a big throne, yes. What about out here? Somebody else throw something out. What else do you think of when you think of a king? A crown. I just happened to bring one with me. Yep, Benton says, yes, it stays. Okay, we're going to hope it. So we think of a crown. I think of the color purple, too, for royalty. And I brought my robe. What else? Expensive jewelry. I kind of feel like maybe I should take some of mine off and share them with y'all because I don't see your best jewelry on. This is shiny. It works, right? So I, I, brought, I brought more in the back. If you need one later on, I can loan you one. 
especially if you're going to be in the presence of a king. Yes. Also gold. So we mentioned purple, but I've got my gold belt on too. I'm looking like royalty here, right? Pretty much to the point where I can make this microphone kind of my scepter, and I might say, Benton, I need you to go do exactly what I ask you to do. Go now. He says he would go do it. Good answer, Benton. Good answer. Because I also typically think of a king who says exactly what they want you to do and off with your head if you don't do it. Because they think they have a lot of power and they want everything brought and given to them for them because of who they are. So, this is Christ the King Sunday. We kind of talked about what kings are like. But the more I got to thinking about it, yes, Ben, what else you got? That's exactly right. They are the boss of each town. That's exactly right. They are the boss of their towns, and they don't play. If they say it, you're supposed to do it, right? So then that makes me think. I was thinking about kings a little more. We've talked before about how Jesus doesn't do much that's like what we expect. When he was here among us, he didn't look like everybody else. He didn't do like everybody else thought he should, even his own disciples. His own disciples had pictured that he would look something like this with a crown and with robes and ordering people around, and the Israelites would get their place in the world and in history because Jesus would be king of all their armies. And yet, is that really what Jesus turns out to be as a king? No. Mm -mm. So Jesus didn't even wear a crown, even though if anybody deserved having a crown, it was him. He also didn't really care about fancy jewelry and things. I don't know about the gold tie. Gold might be a little bit flashy for who Jesus was. Let's get rid of that. And I got lots of compliments on my purple robe before the service this morning. But I also don't think Jesus would have been wearing that either. No, I actually think that on our Christ the King Sunday that Jesus might have looked a little more like this. Simple tie around his robe and wearing something that symbolized serving others. When he had the opportunity to be king here on earth, he took off the towel and he bent down, knelt down, and washed the disciples' feet when really most kings would have been expecting, get down here and wash my feet. And then the other thing is, we've already talked about he really wouldn't care too much about all of those fancy things that we might bring to him as gifts, because what he really wants, we already have. What is this right here, Benton? It's a heart. That's what he wants from us most of all. So as a king, he looks completely different, and yet... We celebrate Christ the King as the greatest King of all time and for all time. What he really wants is our heart, and he really wants us to have his heart for loving other people. And those things would make him proudest as King. Completely different, and yet so, so very special. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for continually reminding us that you flip things upside down. Jesus, you don't look like every other king in the world. And that's exactly who we love as our king. You showed us by modeling for us instead of expecting to be given to you as king. You modeled for us the love and the treatment of others that you expect from us because we know you. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are, Christ the King. Amen.
and rejoin the parent. Sherry, thank you. Children, you heard this is Christ the King, but Christ the King not in earthly kingly form. Christ came as a servant with a servant's heart to shepherd us, his sheep. Let us prepare to hear the word brought to us from Cam as from the Old Testament, the prophet reading of Ezekiel. Let us prepare to hear. The Lord continually watches all of God's own sheep. They are led to green pastures and brought before stilled waters. Praise God for God's tender and loving care. O Lord, open our spirits to respond to your words of compassion. Amen. Joey, we're actually going to switch things up today. I tag Thomas, um, who's going to read the Old Testament reading. Ezekiel 34, 11 through 16, 20 through 24. For thus says the Lord God, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As shepherds seek out their flocks when they are among their scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places to which they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. I will bring them out from the people and gather them from their countries and will bring them into their own land. I will feed them on the mountain of Israel by the water courses and in all the inhabited parts of their land. I will feed them with good pasture in the mountain heights of Israel. Of Israel shall be their pasture. There they shall lie down in the good grazing land and they shall feed on rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek them, I will seek the lost, and I will bring, I will bring the stray back. I will, bring, I will bring back the strayed, and I will bring up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak. But the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them with injustice. I will feed them with justice. Therefore, thus the Lord God to them, I myself will judge between fat sheep and, le- and the lean sheep. Because you pushed with flank and shoulder, and butted at all the weak animals with your horns until you scattered them far and wide. I will save my flock, and they, and they shall no longer be ravaged, and I will judge between sheep and sheep. I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall prince among them. I, the Lord God, have spoken. Thank you, Thomas. Praise be to God who seeks us out in our brokenness. He's both the lamb and the shepherd. And in our brokenness sent Christ the king who went to the cross to forgive the sin of the world. Let us now move into a time of humble confession. Lord, you are our God. You are both our lamb and shepherd. Holy one, in confession we acknowledge we are like sheep that stray from your fold. We are the perpetually hungry, ever in spiritual need, and at times in physical want. But so are others. We are the naked, with wounds exposed and bleeding. But so are others. We are the sick, fevered, chilled, and in pain. But so are others. We are the strangers, separated from ourselves, and from others. Hear us now as we confess our brokenness and our need. We offer up our silent prayers.
like sheep have gone astray. Each in his and her own way. We all like sheep do stupid things. But we all like sheep are loved by the shepherd who calls us by name, who begs us and seeks us out to return. So in our confession of sin, in our confession of brokenness, to do so simply opens up the opportunity for our return to the one who most loves us, to the one who cares for us. So hear these words of assurance, O sheep, O children of the King. Our Creator God sees our hunger, and He gives us food. Christ the Healer touches our wounds, offering comfort and blessed relief. The Spirit blows through us, cools our fever, and eases our pain. God sees and touches and heals our wounds. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
Amen. Both Joey and my wife have uh, told me that I didn't have my mic on just a second ago. And I think it is very important that all of us here, and especially for those of you who are at home, we hear what just might be the most important words that we say every Sunday. Your sins are forgiven. You are reconciled. You are no longer a lost sheep. You've come home. And the shepherd feeds you and loves you and tends to you. Amen. We come to a time of prayer. We come to a time really of offering. We haven't been passing plates like we normally do. And I want to say that I miss that part of the service. I miss coming down here, and I miss the ushers coming forward because it's a visible sign of making that offering for all of us to acknowledge that God doesn't need our money, and God doesn't need our wealth. But God welcomes us to come and be transformed in that offering. So for those of you who are faithful in your giving, thank you. For those of you who see that as your sacrifice to the Lord, our King, thank you. But also for those of you who pray earnestly and deeply, who come transparently to God in worship, in confession, and in reconciliation, I also say thanks be to God. So we come now to make an offering. We've been offering our praise, but now it's time to offer something deep inside the concern, the joy, the fear, and the hope. We offer now as we enter into a time of prayer. I want to offer some names that others have shared with me. Um, Missy's niece um, has had some medical issues, Callie. We ask that you pray for Callie Saunders. We pray for George Navarrete as he now goes into this new life without Dolores by his side. For Don and Joreen Williams and the faithfulness that Don continues to show his wife as she is at home. For Dot Tennyson, we continue to pray for her as she has been recovering from surgery and now COVID. So we will continue to hold her in our hearts. For Hetty Bradshaw, Hetty is home, by the way. Hetty is no longer in rehab. She is at home and she is able to move around um, and still as wonderful and feisty as she, our beloved Hetty, always is. For Ken and Lori Martin, one of our AV team, um, as Ken is at the hospital and Lori is at home, Ken actually asked us to pray for Lori. Uh, I text Ken periodically, and I noticed this morning on Facebook that he was feeling nominally better, and he's looking forward to coming home. As Cam and I have been talking, we also pray for the general well-being of our students, for the upheaval that they are facing. For those of us who are older, we can stop and acknowledge that their lives are completely upside down right now, for their teachers, but especially for them, their normalcy, their community, their friends, their dances, their get-togethers. This is a time of shadows for them, of loneliness for them. And I want us to hold all of our students in our hearts and acknowledge that this is not happy time for them to not be at school, to have to school from home. So students who are here, we hold you. This is not the way we want you to have to do your school either. And for last, we just pray for our leaders whether it's the leaders of our denomination, whether it's the leaders of our state and our country, for wisdom, we pray. Whatever else that you hold as your offering to God, I ask you now to present it to God as that which is deep and true within you as we now pray. Oh God, the chaos, it's still here. It seems like the chaos the waves of crushing water are always upon us. Oh God, speak your light, please. 
May your mighty voice calm the waters. Oh God, we need to be reminded that you are king enthroned on high. But that you care and you see and you come. Oh God, we praise you. We worship you. But we do so with a pit in our stomach, confusion in our minds, a sadness in our hearts. But somewhere in there is a hope. A hope in knowing that this will end. That you are here. That the chaos will not overcome. That you will shepherd us as your sheep. And the kind of king that you are is the kind of person that we saw in Jesus Christ. Indeed, truly the King of kings and Lord of lords, but in no way like the way we want him to be, but oh, how much the way that we need him to be. So God, we make this offering to you, not of part of ourselves, but our whole selves. We offer this to you as your beloved children. We offer this to you in a deep hunger and a deep need of being welcomed by you. Oh, Father in heaven, when we have nothing else to pray, we know that we can pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We are about to hear some very important words that our King spoke. Our King Jesus spoke. I invite you to stand if, in person or in spirit so that we can hear and pay attention to the words that faith is about to read. The gospel lesson comes from Matthew 25, 31 through 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory and all the nations will be gathered before him. He will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, come, that you are blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it we saw you as a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it, did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, Depart from me into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I've been struggling to know how to start this sermon. Because when I read these passages and when I was studying them, I began to feel heavy. I began to feel guilty. I began to feel like I wasn't doing enough. I began to question where my place was with God. Every face that I had passed by without smiling, every person 
that I knew was in need and didn't stop to help. All of that became crushing down on me. And I really struggled. And I honestly continued to struggle when this particular sermon of Jesus is preached because it's unavoidable. There's sometimes we can look at it and go, well, you know, if you move the word this direction or this translation has it this way, maybe, maybe it really means this. This really means what it means. And it means that Jesus loves his sheep. That's what it really means. We go all the way back to Ezekiel and we see God's love and care for God's own flock. And in there, we begin to see an interest in how the sheep are treating the sheep. Another challenging presentation of who God is and who God expects us to be. In this prophet, in his voice, what we see here is God calling the weak sheep back home. They've been scattered They've been scattered by the enemy. They've been taken away into a foreign land, and they were beginning to come home. And there was joy, and there was celebration. But Ezekiel saw something that God didn't like. God saw that the wealthy and the powerful and those with lots of food and those with healthy amounts of calories were ignoring the weak sheep. They weren't taking care of them. We see where God says, though, that I will seek the lost, I will bring back the strayed, I will bind up the injured, I will strengthen the weak. But oh, those overfed, those strong ones I will destroy. You know what? I'm going to feed them with justice instead. Because that's what they need. They need justice. It sounds, again, so harsh, but hear the underlying, deep, abiding truth in these passages. The Lord loves His sheep. God loves God's people. How much does God love God's people? Just look. Just read. I'm going to go find all of them. I'm not going to leave one of them behind. I'm going to go grab them all. But when I see, now is when I begin to feel the guilt come back. But when I see those of you who have everything that this world has to offer, and you are bumping people out of the way, and you are clamoring to the front, and you are taking the choice food again, even though you have enough, I myself will come and judge the fat sheep and the lean sheep. I myself will come and say, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? I will save my flock. I will no longer let them be ravaged. And I'm going to judge between the sheep and the sheep. And I will set up over them one shepherd. Through the line of my servant David, he's going to feed them. He's going to feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken this. So as far back as God had people, there was this brokenness. God sees this and says, but I love all of my sheep. I love every single one of you. And I want your life to be different. I want the way that you live and the way that you act to be different. It's not a harsh judgment. It's grace. It's a deep and abiding acknowledgement that why, if God cared, he wouldn't say what he was saying. It's like being a parent and watching your children fight with each other. I love you. Why are you doing this? It's time for care, for love. It's time for justice. It's time for rightness. Years later, when the promise comes and the fulfillment comes, Jesus is here. And he comes to seek and save the lost. He comes to leave the 99 behind and grab that one that is not with them. 
This is our Lord. This is our King. And as Sherry pointed out so well, did not show up in the clothing. We're about to go into Advent. Didn't even show up in the place. Didn't show up with the parents. Didn't show up with the power and the money. And instead, it was shepherds that heralded his coming. And it was magicians from a foreign land who came and finally acknowledged that he was a king in the first place. This is who we are. We are these kind of sheep, and he is that kind of Lord. So in this parable, not sorry, it's not a parable, it's a clear teaching of Jesus, I find three questions. Three questions that challenge me, that challenge you, and that challenge us. And I want to make it very clear that I still feel a heavy burden as I read these words. Let's remember where this story is. We've been doing this for several months now, Joey. We've been in Matthew. We've we've skipped a few places to come back later. But really what's going on is that Jesus had been preparing his disciples Building up to conflict, brokenness, change is coming. The temple is about to be destroyed. The end of the people of Israel is nigh. And Jesus is trying to prepare his sheep. He's trying to say, this is going to happen. Remember, we talked just recently about being prepared. About a door closing when we're not prepared. So... Here they are, quaking in their boots, their sandals, I suppose. And Jesus says this. Did you hear the good news in it, though? Because he says that there's, going to time a, there's a, a time coming where the king there in the center and all of the nations and all of the people will be gathered just like a shepherd separates the sheep and the goats. And he's going to want to know, what did you do to my brothers and my sisters? Did you hear that? Jesus, this is the truth of this passage. It's hard for us to hear because of the way we've heard it in the past. Jesus is actually saying, faith and faith, I'll make you both sheep. How you were treated is how the world will be judged. Those of you who are my brothers and my sisters, hear this good news. The time will come when the world will be laid out, all of us, and Jesus will say, how did you treat the poor, the sick, the hungry, the hurting, the naked, the lonely, who are my brothers and sisters. The world will be judged on how they receive you. What's so hard for us to hear in this passage is that, like Ezekiel, how many of us are more like the fat bully, have everything sheep, as opposed to our brothers and sisters who have nothing? This is really what Jesus is culminating all of this down to. Jesus loves, King Jesus loves his sheep. His concern is for his sheep. He loves his sheep so much, Kramer, that there's going to come a time when someone is going to say, but Jesus, I didn't see you. And Jesus is going to say, but you welcomed Kramer. You went to his side when he was in that horrible car wreck. You prayed for him. You attended to his needs. Come in. I want you in here. Because when you received Kramer, you received me. Yes, yes, yes. That is what Jesus is saying here. But I still think the reason why we find it so complicated is because we don't see ourselves as the vulnerable in the story, do we? We don't see ourselves as those people. And it could just be, again, that we are not in any way familiar with seeing Christ in others. These people who 
cared for the stranger, the naked, the imprisoned. Those people didn't do it because they knew it was the king. Hear me again. They weren't out trying to earn their salvation in any way. They simply had compassion on a person. They didn't know it was Jesus. They didn't know it was the king. The king wasn't dressed that way. They simply had compassion, and that person happened to be a brother or sister of Jesus. And Jesus says, that's good enough for me. So here are the questions. Here are the questions that I think confront us now. What is your relation to the king and his people? What is my relation to the king and his people? Faith, we talked about that this week. It's not about, I didn't say what is your relationship with Jesus. I want to know what is your relation to the king. It's very easy to make our faith about me, 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 me. I feel very good today. I don't feel very good today. I had my quiet time today. I didn't have my quiet time today. And all of a sudden, we use that as the basis of, oh, I'm in a good relationship. No, what is your relation to the king and his people? Because in this story, we don't see there's an ability to separate those two. Because when you're serving the king, you're going to be serving the king's people. Last year, this time, we had among us, do you all remember Marcel Sachu? Do you remember the missionary that came from the Central African Republic? In that moment, in that time on Christ the King Sunday, Crossgate United Methodist Church did something that matched what we see here. We welcomed a brother of Jesus who had barely anything to do his ministries over in CAR, and we welcomed him. This is what we're talking. What is your relation to the king and his people? Who are we actively every day seeking in relation with one another? Number two, are you prepared to see the king? Are you prepared? Jesus was getting us prepared up to this point. Are you prepared? Because when we say to one another, I see Christ in you, we're making a profoundly ethical statement, a moral statement Rich, when I say I see Christ in you, I'm now drawn to you, to serve you, to love you, to care for you, to feed you if you're hungry, to visit you if you're sick, to seek you out if you've been kicked out. Are you prepared to see his face in others? Are you really prepared? Or, Sherry, is it truly, truly that we still want to see Jesus wrapped in purple, crown on his head so that we could readily identify Jesus? When in reality, you're one of his children. You're one of his sisters. So when I go and serve you, who am I serving? Jesus. Are you comfortable with me even allowing me to serve you? Because I see Christ in you. That's the second question. Are we prepared to see him in them? None of these people in this story that Jesus was telling had any clue about Jesus. None of them had a clue. But they had compassion on people who were poor and sick and hungry and hurting, who might have been out there doing it the way that Jesus was asking. And the final question is this one. How are you, how are we treating kinfolk? Because that's how we're treating the king. How are we treating one another? How truly are we treating one another in this church or out in the world? When you encounter another brother and sister in Christ, and you know that they are, but they look different, smell different, live in a different place, they're your kin. And we're in a kingdom now. Jesus is our kin. Brings us in and says, how have you been treating my kin? 
And there's going to come a time where it's either going to be Jesus saying, this sheep is fat and eating way more than my skinny sheep, or Jesus is going to say, that's definitely a goat, and you're a sheep, and I am so proud of the way you treated me because of the way you treated others. Jesus is about to be crowned, and he's getting his kin prepared. Jesus left us. 2,000 years ago. And he said, get prepared, I'm coming back. I'm coming back. And all I want to know is how you treated my kin. Seriously, friends. All I want to know is how you treated my kin. It's an interesting, as I kind of conclude the thoughts for today, I know I'm, I'm actually acknowledging that I'm a little subdued. I'm not preaching my normal way. We carry the weight of acknowledging of that we are kin. And Jesus is our kin. And Jesus is our king. And the way we treat one another is how we're treating the king. But it's interesting in this final thought that judgment here is declared not in doing what is wrong. Judgment is is not declared in what they did that was wrong. To borrow from what Cam has been teaching me, the gospel is not a sin management system. It's something completely different. The judgment that shows here is not doing what is right. Judgment does not come because we did something wrong. Judgment comes when we had an opportunity to do what's right and we chose not to do it. So Crossgates at home and Crossgates here, I have a challenge. I have a very basic challenge for 2021. Can we create and expand ministries here among us? that start where Jesus plans to end. Let me say that again. Can right now we just start doing what we're going to be judged upon at the end? Faye, backpack buddies, literally feeding the hungry. What would happen in the life of Crossgates if we had ministries literal to the text. Widows and orphans, we know that that's true religion in the book of James, and now hungry, thirsty, lonely, not clothed well, sick, and in prison. What would happen in our church if instead of all the other things that distract us, we simply said, we know the king is going to come and going to separate the world based upon how they treated his kin. And he literally says, I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. The king is coming. He's coming for his kin. He's coming for his kinfolk. You're one of his sheep. You're one of his kin. Can we see Christ in others? Not wrapped in purple clothes but one with a towel around his waist, ready to serve the poor, the sick, the hungry, the hurting, and the least of these. Crossgates, Trey, we can do this. We can do this. Because God is our shepherd, and he will come and shepherd us. He has shown us how to do it. He has prepared us to do it. 
So we close the year. We close the Christian year of 2020. And we ask God to give us a new vision to help us see Christ in others, to help us be faithful to the King, and to help us to be kin to one another. May it be. We have no mission but to serve in full obedience to the Lord, to care for all without reserve and spread his liberating word. On this Sunday, that is the final Sunday that completes the arc of the church year, these will be the last words we sing in response on Christ the King Sunday. When we recognize that Christ came in vulnerability to show us the power of God's love and asks us to do the same. The tune we sing in these last words to in this service are set to the tune you will recognize as take up thy cross, the Savior said, intentionally paired with this text. Let us stand as we respond with the Church of Christ in every age. The Church of Christ in every age is set by change, but Crossgates, crossgates here and crossgates at home. I see Christ in you. So it's time to go now. It's time for you to go into the world to be the poor, the sick, the hurting, the lonely, to be the one in need. It's time for you to go and be that way. Because that is who our Lord and our King is. Go be among those people. Because when you go and do that, do you know who you will be with? Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Don't be afraid. Because when they welcome you, they are welcoming you. Jesus Christ. So let's go now knowing that we got lots of kinfolk out there. Don't be afraid. Come on. Let's go.